And um, we saw that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, we see the breaking down of the understanding of faith. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Such, in, um, such a beautiful uh, scripture, but um, the scriptures also has the empowerment of identity. We're going to go ahead and talk about some areas about faith. Amen. Very, very vital for us to understand that faith is the substance, the substance of things hope for. Come on, say hope for. Amen. The evidence of things not seen. So when we are working through our faith, amen, it's the evidence of things that we cannot see yet. Amen. We can't see them. But how many know that faith brings them to pass? Amen. That's what faith is. Faith brings it to pass. Amen. Uh, we see this awesome scripture in the book of Hebrews. I mean, the book of Romans, chapter 4, verse 13. This is the start of faith. Amen. When we accepted Jesus Christ in our, as our personal Savior, we accepted him by faith, believing that God is doing something through us. Can you give me an amen? That Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Amen. That was uh, the reason why when we accepted Jesus is because we understood that Jesus is the mediator to get to heaven. And to get to heaven, we must understand that we must accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And as we accept Jesus Christ by faith, can you give me an amen? It's not a feeling. It's not a feelings. We're not going to have these feelings, amen, which they do come, amen, but we're not always going to have them, amen. But through the sense of doing this, we start seeing the growth in our life. Can you give me an amen? The scripture says like this. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. Can you give me an amen? But through the righteousness of faith. See that word faith? Now remember, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So you must understand that when he's saying faith there is something that I don't see. I don't understand. I don't see that I'm righteous and that I need Jesus to get to heaven. Oh, come on. We need Jesus to get to heaven. That's right. You must understand that before you leave this world, you must accept Jesus Christ to get to heaven. If you do not have Jesus Christ, then my brother and sister, heaven is not going to be for you. You must understand that there is also a hell. And the reason why we accept Jesus is because Jesus is the mediator that forgives us of our sins yesterday, today, and tomorrow. How many thank God just for that statement right there? Oh, come on. Some of you should be grateful for that. Amen. That he is our mediator. That he is our mediator. That he is the one that's uh, forgiving us. He's the one that's working through us. He's the one that gave us something called righteousness. Without righteousness, we are not able to obtain anything, anything good from God. In other words, even though those people that don't have Jesus, they might have good things. But remember, good things is not just what God brings. It's not just things. It is a, a spiritual promise that was given to the church by God. And it was given to the church for a reason. There was a reason why it was given and here he's saying, I'm displaying the seed. I'm getting ready to move through the sense by faith. Everybody say, by faith. And by faith, he says, and then, so we're going to see the story um, 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 unfold here in verse 20, uh, Romans 4.20. We see here another verse here, and, and, he, and he continues. And he says, he did not waver on the, at the promise of God through unbelief. Now understand that the greatest attack against the gospel of God is unbelief. Oh, come on. Am I speaking to somebody? The greatest attack against the gospel is unbelief. Unbelief is drawn from a lack of doubting. Doubting brings unbelief. The greatest thing you could ever have is believing. Believe in Jesus Christ. Unbelief brings a sense of not allowing the promises to come to pass. And the word of God says like this, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. In other words, even though when Abraham wasn't able to have a child with Sarah, because that was a promise that was given to him, how many here have promises? 
uh, three people. How many here have promises? He says he did not waver in unbelief. Now, we must understand that. It's, it's kind of simple, but kind of deep in a sense. Because you must understand that your unbelief, when you mix unbelief and you believe in Jesus, but I also have unbelief, you're having a mixture of cold and hot. Amen? It's not the sin that's making you cold and hot. It's your unbelief that's making you cold and hot. Your unbelief is like a cancer to your spiritual life. And this is why he came and said, unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Now, understand this, that verse 21, we're going to continue here. And he says, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Now, I have a question. What miracles you've been asking God to perform? What children are you praying for that you're asking God, Lord, save them? Now, I want you to close your eyes right now. What promise, what miracle do you need from God? Okay? If you said what you're declaring to God, you're preaching to the unseen world. You're saying to the unseen world that today in the name of Jesus, this is going to be fulfilled. The Bible says, come on, give the Lord a clap offering. That's right. The Bible says that Abraham did not waver. In unbelief. You know, how many of us have wavered before in unbelief? And we've seen this time after time where the enemy comes and strikes us against our unbelief. But the Bible says it's being fully convinced. Now, you must understand that Abraham was not just the fact of that. Um, he didn't just say, okay, God, I get you at your word. No, he was convinced that he was, that that was going to happen. Convinced doesn't have to do with the sense of repeating yourself. In your spirit, in your mind, you know that I don't know when it's going to happen, but I know God's going to do it. <laughs> Is there anybody in the house of God? Being fully convinced. Come on, look at your neighbor and tell him, are you fully convinced in the promise that God has for your life? He says he was fully convinced he was also able that he was going to perform it. In other words, not just convinced that it was going to happen, but God, you're going to perform this miracle for me. Did he say that Abraham went and asked God for it or he prayed for this? Or No, he didn't say any of that, which is all oh, that's awesome. But the truth is, is that once God told him it was going to happen, it came to pass. Not in the time that Abraham wanted it. It came to pass when God released it and performed it at the time that Abraham was going to appreciate what he was going to have. Because the promise that he had was the fact of a son named Isaac. And Isaac was the beginning birth of giving Jesus Christ light. So it was important for Isaac to be born. Every promise that God has given you is going to give light in some area of your life. Is there anybody in the house of God? Now you must understand in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and I want to uh, let me let me let me give you a little quick revelation and then we're going to go back into the preaching. In Genesis 1:1 1, 1, when God gives light into that promise sometimes people think it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth but yet the beginning was not the first day. Look at your neighbor and tell him the beginning is not the first day. That's right. The first day was verse 5. The Bible says like this is in verse 5 it says God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Sometimes the beginning, we get confused with the beginning and not understanding you haven't even started your first day. The first day only comes when the light comes. No, you're not hearing me today. Is there anybody in the house of God? Some of you have begun with God, but yet you have not allowed the light to be the manifestation of what God wants to do in the promise. In John 1, 1, he says this. He says, he is the word. Come on now. Come on. It says, John 1, 1. He gives us a sense. The beginning is not the first day. Just, you, just because you've begun with God doesn't mean you've begun. In other words, you could begin, 
But it's not the first day until you have the first day. What's the first day? When the light came alive in your life. When you understood who he is. When you understood that, God, I'm in the midst of the situation, I know you're with me. Can you give me an amen? And some of you say, I believe in God, but you're in the beginning. You haven't begun your first day. Come on, look at your neighbor and tell him, begin your first day. Let me prove it to you. The first day did not come until Jesus came into your life. If you don't have Jesus here today, I pray that Jesus come into your life. Because he is the light that shines through you to be able to allow you to see beyond what you could see in a carnal mentality. In the beginning, verse, verse 1 and 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, was God. He says, He was in the beginning with God. So, in the beginning, He was with God. Verse 3, All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. In other words, Unless Jesus Christ comes into your heart, nothing is going to be able to be fulfilled in your life the way God wants it to be fulfilled. Because it's the light's responsibility. It's the light responsibility to fulfill the promise of God. Come on, look at your neighbor and tell him it's the light. That's right. The light. It's awesome. The light. And without the light. We cannot see the true nature of what God really wants to do. Without the light, we cannot see what faith, the substance of things hold for, the evidence of things not seen. We cannot see it. It is the light, which is Jesus coming into your heart. You begin, and then the first day begins. Have you ever started your first day at school? How many know we get nervous? Joe, can you give me that water over here? How many get nervous in the first day? I remember when my first day at school, I heard that first day, well, fights. Everybody's getting fights the first day. Everybody's getting expelled just right the first day. Wearing my first clothes. Come on, have everybody been there? Am I the only one? Or you know what I'm talking about, right? You're rocking fresh, boy, with the new shoes. Come on, right? Back then, pro, my pro wings, come on, my pro wings, right? They were not Nikes, they were pro wings. Walking at school, trying to find my class. Asking everybody, hey, you got this teacher? No, oh, I got her at second. Oh, I got her at first, but we're, who, who's in that class? Do you know who's in that class? Especially, you're trying to find out who's in that class because if you don't like somebody, It seems like the first day when you, the light comes in you, it seems like everything that was in darkness in your life comes to light. And when that darkness comes into light, your trouble starts vanishing because God starts giving light in your trouble. It seems like it's that first day that you walk. And you're walking in and you said, God, I allowed you to come into my heart. That's right, you allowed him. He's a gentleman. He don't come in forcefully comes into your heart and that and then the beginning was that you allowed him in your heart the first day is when you started walking in that light manifesting God in that light manifesting the goodness of God in that light letting God be God in your life seeing God through the areas of your life so you you and I must understand today that the enemy has came in to try to rob you from what God is trying to do this is why, this is why we must understand when we start seeing what faith is getting ready to do, purpose tries to come out. But when purpose is not birthed, you just become the beginning. You haven't started your first day. Because the first day was the purpose, the purpose of the light is to give, to cast out darkness. Did you hear what I just said? Very important that you understand this. When you walk without purpose, but yet you have Jesus, but you have no purpose for that light, the light hasn't begun. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, look at what he says here. Scripture here. Those that are in line, are you following? Let's look at this scripture. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, 
I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty and swept and put in order. Everybody say salvation. In other words, the house is a body, is a person. And the Bible is saying that it was clean and put in order. In other words, it had salvation. When salvation comes into your life, you have order because Jesus gave you the order even though you don't have no order. You must understand that, that he is responsible for the order inside of you. Now, if you're not manifesting that order outside of you, that's a whole different other story and a whole different other Bible study. But when he comes in you, he puts order. Boom. He cleans the house. Come on. Cleans the house. Cleans the house means that you're calling, you know, forgive me for what I did. Come on. I mean, first got saved. Amen. You're telling everybody about Jesus. Hello. Come on. I haven't stopped. Amen. In other words, the, the house is clean. You got saved. God, God, God said, you, you felt in your spirit. He said, I'm going to heaven. That's, that was the, the biggest news that you could ever have, telling your family, I'm going to heaven. Do you have Jesus? Do you have Jesus? Do you? Because the gospel is about the good news. The good news is about that you're forgiven of your sins to go to heaven. But and then Jesus explains something in red letters in your Bible. Something that he's trying to bring across to his people. And he says, the house was clean. And everybody has preached this in the sense of saying, and he says, and when it comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Verse 45 says, then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. It's amazing to see the word first, huh? In other words, you haven't even got to your first day, but the first already became your last day. And he says that so shall it also be with the wicked generation. He speaks something, and when we go back to, the, to, the, to, the, to verse 44, he says something very important. Many people have been, and I want to speak into the internet, many people have spoken about this scripture that sin came back into the house because that's why demons came back. That's not what the scripture's saying. The scripture's saying that the house was clean and it was put in order. But yet, how did the devil come back and destroy my life? How? Well, the Holy Spirit told me something. You ready? I'm going to drop it. You ready? Thank you. Man, man that's what we need. That's right. We're going to drop it. Ready? The Lord told me, the reason why demons came back is because the purpose of the house was to be used, not to be empty and fixed. There was no more purpose in that house. Satan seeks after people that have lost their purpose. And when they don't begin your purpose, that's why you constantly are attacked. If you focus on the purpose, Satan does not have an entry back into the house because the house is occupied. Come on, look at somebody and tell them my house is occupied. My house is occupied. When the enemy comes knocking back at your door, how many have ever been there before? And you're like, well, we don't need to do that. We don't need to do this. We don't need to do that. Be careful that the enemy don't uproot you to take you away from the faith of what you believe he uproots you and starts in planning the purpose in other words let me prove to you about purpose in Matthew chapter 3 verse 17 verse let's go to Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 and look at when Jesus gets tempted at the desert Jesus got attacked Two ways. He didn't have three temptations, even though the Bible says three temptations. But those three temptations were after two things in Jesus. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Verse 2. And when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these 
stones to become bread. Now, let's stop there. We don't have to go no further. We must understand that the scripture and the story is saying that when Jesus started his temptation, everybody say temptation. The temptation, the first thing that the devil did to take him away from his faith, away from his purpose, was the fact, tempt him with his identity. He said, if you are the son of God, if you, if, if, in other words, if Jesus is truly in your life, why isn't this happening in your life? That's the first thing he starts attacking is your identity. Just look at your neighbor and tell him the devil got it all wrong. Come on, tell him your devil got it all wrong. The devil got it all wrong. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Because the devil didn't actually speak what he needed to speak the right way because he couldn't speak it. Because his name was not the son of God. Let's go ahead and go to Matthew chapter 3 verse 17 really quick. Because we go ahead and preach. How many want to preach the word of God? Can you give me an amen? And suddenly a voice. This is one. This is the last verse after the temptation. He says, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. What did, G, what did God call his son? His beloved. In other words, God had named Jesus the beloved. When Satan understands, the first thing he draws you away from is your identity. First thing he starts doing is that everybody's so confident about God because you see things happening for others, but why don't you see them? Because God's not with you. Because you fell in this, and because you're not good enough, and because you did this last night, and remember when you thought of this, and remember when you did this, and you start feeling shorter and shorter and shorter in your faith, when now the enemy starts deceiving you away from your purpose. The devil's not after your house. He's not, af he's not after anything physical. He's after your purpose. And if he takes your purpose, why purpose? Because your purpose is the key to somebody else's salvation. He works under the temptation of your feeling. Listen, look at this. Look at this. He don't call him the beloved son. What does he call him? He call him, look at what the devil calls him. Matthew chapter 3, I mean chapter 4, verse 3, I think it was, right? Look at this. Let's go back, come on. He says, he calls him what? You are the what? The son. He didn't call him the beloved. He called him the son. Look at your neighbor and tell him I'm the beloved. This is what Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 says. You must understand that your identity is what being attacked, not the identity physical identity the spiritual identity come on say it to your neighbor i'm the beloved come on say it again i'm a beloved and god called me for a purpose and the devil's trying to destroy my purpose he destroys my purpose he destroys the devil destroys my purpose in spanish like, like we said we say it two two languages right no me da la gana para hacer nada i don't feel like doing nothing no more well, why don't you feel like doing nothing? Because the devil knew where to attack you, to take you away from God's doing in your life. Look at this. He says, having predestined us. No, let's go to, uh, 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 let's go to six, six, six. He says, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us what? Accepted in the what? Accepted in Christ. Who's the beloved? Jesus. We're in Christ. That's why you're, you should be calling yourself the, that's right, I'm the beloved. Come on, Jesus loves me. I don't care if you're going through some hardship. Come on now. I don't care if nothing's lining up. You are the, you are the, because the truth is, is as long as you hold on to your identity, you're holding on to the promise. As long as you hold on to the promise, understand that righteousness is bringing it to you. It's manifesting the promise that God has for your life. Come on, say it again. I'm the beloved. This word beloved is the be loved. In other words, I am loved by the one that accepted me. He's not saying, he's not talking about your perfection. He's not talking about your physicality. He's talking about who you accepted. It's about the one that you accepted. Is there anybody in the house? So when the demon comes back to tempt you, he says, the house is clean. And he says that seven more came back to the house. Well, was that because the house was dirty? Because demons only go where dirty places are at? No, it was at a place because the house was empty. It was, even though the couches were lined up, everything was in its place, the house was not being used for what the house is supposed to be used for. This part is called the house. Physical. Not called the temple. 
You have the temple of the Holy Spirit is inside of you. That's where holiness is at. But this house must start moving what the temple is bringing out into its character. Because the enemy takes you away from your purpose to strike your character. And when the devil strikes your character, he strikes your favor. But the fact, of the truth is, is that the enemy has struck in the center core of your identity to get where? Can he strike the Holy Spirit? No. He strikes your mind. That's why he says, renew your mind daily. Because if you don't renew your mind and says, I've forgiven them. No, Satan, you are not going to do that to me. I am not going to allow this to happen. And the enemy strikes your mind and your mind starts speaking what? Negative. And when your mind speaks negative, your outer house starts moving under your negativity. And then the house is clean still. Because Jesus will not deny himself. Even though you deny him, he will not deny himself, the Bible says. He's faithful to himself. So even though inside I'm clean, my house is not doing. Why? Because I'm offended in my mind. And because I'm offended in my mind, it starts hitting me in my character. In my character, I don't feel like serving you nothing today. But I thought you forgave me on Valentine's. Yeah, but I just remember right now in the shower what really happened. You know. You know. Come on now, you know, and it takes you on a routine for 40 days and 40 years and 40 nights over and over and over. You had the same conversation with the same people two years ago, three years ago, five years ago. You talk about that problem 10 years ago, but the truth is he's had you on a good one. You've been in the desert and God's telling you today, today's the end of your desert in the name of Jesus. I'm speaking to somebody that's online. Today's the day they will not come in. Seven more will not come back into my purpose. Seven more will not welcome back in. This is why the Bible says seven times you shall fall, but seven times you shall rise. Why? Because as soon as you answer to the purpose, Satan will come back at you, knocking at your door, telling you, come on, baby, come back to me. But light will be shaking himself, and everybody's trying to give you something. Come back to me, baby. Go back to me. Sorry for preaching passionately, but the truth is, is that... The enemy goes after you when you're lonely, when you're doubtful. Remember, it was unbelief. He had no unbelief, and this is why the promise came to pass. Because even though when he was at the lowest place of his life, Satan came and told him, turn this rock into bread. Turn this rock into provision. See, when you see rock and bread together, it's all good. It's not good. Because rock represents the harden of the heart. The bread means that this bread, you're trying to get your hard heart, your hard heart to produce what only he could produce. Have you ever seen somebody trying to make it happen? I want to fix my marriage. I want to fix this and I'm going to fix that. I'm going to fix the car. You're not a mechanic. Send it to the mechanics. You can't fix it. You can't fix it. Can you give me an amen? I've tried it a thousand times. I put my foot in my mouth. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. And I've apologized to I don't know how many people. Do you know why? Because I try to fix something that God said, the only I can do it. Keep yourself out of it. And there I go, right? Put my foot in my mouth. Because the enemy is after the one thing that God gave you. He gave you free will. And purpose has to do with free will. This is why when Jesus was at the garden of Gethsemane, remember that? Not my will. It's your purpose. Be done. Can you give me an amen? He was trying to strike him at the level of the most sacred place of the one thing you gave God. I gave you my will when I was messed up. I was tore up. I gave you my will. He says, you got the beginning right. But you don't got your first day right. The light's not shining out of you. Why? Because darkness has been held up over me. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness. Darkness doesn't mean sin. Darkness means the one that produces that sin. He keeps a dark world over you so that way you can speak dark, so you can talk dark, so you can uh, have unbelief. And that darkness produces sin in you. When sin comes in, it removes you from the spirit influencing your soul. And your soul starts acting out on what dark world I'm living in right now. Because many of us have a dark cloud. Have you ever seen that dark cloud? The dark cloud over us, and why am I like this? I wake up like this, I go to sleep like this. Why is it like that? Because seven more are trying to come in. Purpose. Purpose, are you not there no more? Is there anybody here? It's not my deeds. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, let's real go ahead and read this. This dark world takes you out. Why? Because we were called to do good works. Good works is to e exemplify the goodness of God out of us to our neighbors, to the loved ones, to the people that are around us. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. This word, good works, is my purpose. And when he gives you a purpose, he gives you a people. When he gives you a people, it's an imperfect people. But yet, God, you put me right there in the good work. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. In it, we should walk in them. The sense of knowing that God has produced salvation. That empowers you to start developing a faith. And that faith start producing a purpose. And that purpose starts giving you life. We put ourselves in. In those areas. And God produces goodness. Can you give me an amen? Have you been there? You put yourself in those things too, in those situations before too? Oh, yeah. We've been there. All of us. All of us have probably been in certain situations. But you know one thing you need to take care of? Is that the devil don't come. Go through the window. Nobody's home. They haven't been home. They haven't been home. Where are they at? They're all in their head. John 10, 10 says that the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Let me explain that really quick. The word kill there is not something that he's trying to kill you. The word kill there, he's killing your purpose. Satan don't work physically. He works spiritually. Because he's the prince of this air. You must understand that. So when Satan comes to take away your purpose he comes to kill your person you don't come and kill the body because he knows the body's gonna die whether you're 110 years old you're gonna die satan doesn't come to do that we do it all ourselves right but however we want to live is we got free will the satan cannot touch you remember when satan went to uh, to, to god and god and he told him if you take your protection away from job and you take everything away from me, he won't serve you no more. Even when Satan had, was not, Jesus had not died at the cross yet, Satan still did not have permission to touch Job. Many people think that Satan comes to take everything from you. No, 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 no. He don't come to take everything from you. He discourages you to take everything from you. Satan comes to tell you, you are the cause of you. And then he blames you, and he beats you up, and he brings condemnation to you to take everything where you don't feel like this, that, that, whatever it is. Because I'm discouraged. I'm beat up. And because I'm beat up, I'm going through it. He comes to kill your purpose. He comes to still. Your, etern your, your eternity salvation. 
Even though eternity, he can't take it, but guess what? He comes to take away heaven on earth from you. And he comes to destroy everything that you try to speak out of your mouth before it, it comes out. I believe my mom's going to get healed. By the time you said it, Satan wants to destroy it. He can't destroy the words, but he destroys it by somebody else speaking something to you that's going to make you doubt. He takes you, and he, and, he, and he starts making you feel like you're worthless. He makes you feel like you're at the end, and you're no good to yourself. Until the point where you start imagining yourself killing yourself. Until you imagine yourself divorced. Until you imagine yourself quitting and, and getting mad. Until you imagine yourself doing it. That imagination will happen and happen over and 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 you know what I'm talking about. Over and over and over and over and unless you start giving the fact and start speaking back to it. Renew your mind until you speak back to that area of that voice in your mind. He's going to have you in 2024. He's going to have you in 2025. He's going to have you in 2026. You can say, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. But you know inside you're suffering. You're going through it. And all you need to do is empty it. Empty it to God. Say, God, here it is. I will not accept what's trying to come to me. God bless everybody. Thank you for joining us. Continue to share and like and be part of any platform that we have in social media. There's devotions and many preachings that are coming out that are going to inspire you to continue to go forward. May you be blessed and live for the gospel life. God bless you.